Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the grace that uh, you give unto us. Thank you for the mercies you extend unto us, and thank you for the weather. We know that uh, there are some, time, some places where rains are going on and some places are dry. Help us to appreciate everything, Lord. And those who have been affected with much rain, Lord, we pray that uh, you may uh, recompense them whatever losses they have, uh, they have uh, incurred. And uh, we just pray that you may fill us with thy spirit. Lord, we may walk in thy statutes and uh, we may be a light unto others. And Father, we may do this work without grudging, and we may look forward to the coming of thy Son, not uh, in fear, but also not in idleness. For the glory and honor of thy name, help us to walk in the light that we have received. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Um, welcome uh, to this presentation. And uh, this is number 24 in the series, uh, The Prophets and the Messengers. And I'm looking at an appeal to common sense, part 12, guiding principles for the end time messages, guiding principles for the end time messages. I know that uh, the Lord is uh, wanting to bless us and uh, he's nigh unto them who seek them, who seek him uh, diligently and uh, this th these messages have been uh, messages which are burdens in my heart so that uh, I may get them out there we may be benefited together the reason why I say this it is because uh, there is a tendency to lack balance in uh, the things that we are doing there is always the running of one extreme to the other extreme from one other extreme point to the other extreme point the lord wants us to have a balanced mind and uh, a balanced mind doesn't mean ecumenism a balanced mind doesn't mean compromise or neutrality but uh a mind can that can pause and uh, reflect, think about the things, do analysis, and uh, be able when uh, uh, we speak that uh, we may be able to speak things that uh, we are thoroughly acquainted with, and uh, in a way that uh, will honor the name of the Lord. We are told. Uh, We are told in uh, James chapter 1, verses 19. I think this is a verse that uh, I like to start with in this presentation. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 19. This is uh, what the scripture says. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And so uh, the point I wanted there is that uh, we should be a people who are slow, very slow to speak something, a slow to wrath, and uh, we should be swift to hear. And swiftness here means uh, listening with an um, understanding not just uh, listening to things without an understanding. And so this is an appeal to common sense. And uh, we look at a few things on uh, guiding principles for the end time messages. How do we deliver these messages? Uh, what is God calling us to do in this work that uh, we are doing? And uh, I just go through some principles that um, are outlined uh, the first principle which applies to all areas of Christian responsibility is that everyone knows for himself what non-duty is. Non-duty at any given moment may not be the same for any two people, yet to back 
at non duty little or much reveals the heart of a rebel a deeper problem than a matter uh not only in that but uh, in many things in 1893 ellen white wrote no one can believe with the heart unto righteousness and obtain justification by faith while continuing the practice of those things which the word of god forbids or while neglecting any known duties and so neglecting known duties will cause weakness and darkness and subject us to fierce temptation. In other words, to hear instruction that God validated through uh, his messengers, but not to incorporate it in our own lives opens the door to other temptations and spiritual darkness. Principle number two. The second principle is that we should do the best we can under all circumstances. For example, in the days when nutritional supplements were not available, or when various vegetables and fruit were not easily obtainable, Ellen White suggested that grape juice in the best in the best form available was appropriate as a food supplement for medicinal purposes. Obviously, she was not suggesting that we that wine be used as recreational beverage or a feature of the regular uh, diet. And so, when dealing with different issues, know the context, know the time, know how this message applied to the primary conduct before you try to apply it to another person the you know we take uh, the letters and the writings of eg white and uh, apply it to everyone without knowing under which circumstances were uh, these things written and uh, the other principle in working for the third angel's message more so on this health uh, health uh, uh, sessions is that uh, avoid every hurtful uh, things that are set before you and uh, use judiciously that which is helpful another principle we get when we are passing this health message is that uh, uh, we should teach people this is the fifth principle to have self-control even in that which is good excessive indulgence in eating and drinking sleeping or seeing is sin and uh, so whether something is good it should be taken with temperance self-control and uh, we, we need a ma balanced mind so as to be able to uh know when things are to be spoken and when things should not be spoken now in our preaching the messages when uh, the sixth principle forbids us to making men think that we are on a certain level their criterion and uh forcing them to adopt everything that we subscribe to be uh, thinking that we are the ones who are on the right. And this is a very important principle, principle number six. At every course, at every instance, we should avoid uh, making ourselves criterions for people. The reason is that if we do this, if something happens to us, peradventure, God forbid, and we fall into apostasy or we do something that is bad, it doesn't just end in our lines alone, but um, it goes beyond us and hurts many people. And that is why always we should be pointing people to Jesus Christ. And... Uh, I understand there's a point that she says that uh, we should never be, uh, uh, I'm trying to paraphrase, and uh, because I don't have the quote immediately, we should never be sure of our salvation. But uh, I want to understand what she was really driving at is that um, whoever thinks that he's standing, he should be careful lest he falls. I think he, she was in those parameters. Whoever thinks that uh, he is standing, he should take care lest he fall. And so that is why preachers, they are warned, never point people to yourself, but always point people to the Son of God.
the author and finisher of our salvation. There is no other name given under heaven that man should be saved by the name of uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, when uh, there was uh, a problem in uh, Corinth, Paul was able to ask them, was Peter crucified for you? Was Paul baptized for you? What about Apollos and all this stuff? Because you find that um, we start developing these ideas of uh, favorite ministers and um, trying to mimic them in everything, even in our talk, even in our dress, even in our eating manners. You say that, uh, look at so and so brother. It, it's good for people to really be attracted to Christ in you rather than just to be attracted to you. I hope we get that difference because I'm trying to labor so much on that point. It is good for people to be attracted to the Christ in you rather than to be attracted to your own person. Because if they get attached to you and not your Christ, then when things fall, not a single person falls, but many will fall because they have been told to look unto man. That is why in the message of righteousness by faith, in testimonies uh, to ministers and gospel workers, page 91 and 92, we are told that the people had lost sight of Christ and they had to be pointed to his divine person. People had been, uh, had been used to be pointed to a creature rather than the creator. And uh, this was a big problem in 1888. And that is why you find that the people who are really on the side of Uriah Smith and uh, the general conference president and Nicole and other elders, and you had other people on the side of Wagona, E.G. White, and uh, um, Willie White, and Jonas. And the others didn't know even what to do because they were caught up in the midst. If people had been trained to look unto Jesus, they wouldn't even look at Jonas, Wagona, or E.G. White, or Uriah Smith, um, and uh, the other elders that were there. But um, they will take their Bible and analyze what is being spoken. And then um, follow the truth rather than follow the men. It's dangerous for ministers to start directing people to themselves. I hope uh, I have belabored that point enough and uh, it is well understandable. And so... Another principle when uh, really um, preaching these end time messages, uh, the seventh principle is that we should reveal care and compassion, whether it be on health principle, whether it be on an educational line, whether it be on whichever reform that we are going to preach. Nothing should be urged without placing yourself in the shoes of a person. We should manifest caring and compassion. And uh, there are times that you have heard that Jesus Christ or John the Baptist did this. And uh, so a minister of God should do this uh, and that. Uh, if, if I can't find a statement in desire of ages, uh, Now, in the South Ages, page 353.1, just on this point number seven, that we should have care and compassion while preaching any message. And people quote uh, John the Baptist that uh, he was able to call um, the Pharisees, you vipers, and Jesus uh, was calling the Pharisees hypocrites. But I, I want us to read a statement on this issue of being caring and compassion in every message that we preach outside there. Um, in Desire of Ages, page 353.1, uh, I'll start a little bit earlier. The one in yellow, the Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain, 
of the Lord's host comes down to direct the battle. Our infirmities may be many, our sins and mistakes grievous, but the grace of God is for all who seek it with contrition. Know that people are seeking Christ with the, all their hearts, and they may be falling short of this and this, but our infirmities may be many, our sins and mistakes grievous, but the grace of God is for all who seek it with contrition. The power of omnipotence is enlisted in behalf of those who trust in God. Now, the statement I want is this. Behold, said Jesus, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Remember this, harmless as doves. And we are talking about being caring and compassion in any message that we are going to preach. Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth. True, but he spoke it always in what? In love. He exercised the great tact and thoughtful kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not sense a human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved, that refused to receive him, the way, the truth, and life. They rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with fitting tenderness and sorrow so deep that it broke his heart. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he always bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with tenderest rigor to every member of the family of God. In all men he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. Such a kind of spirit to those people who are called Christians should be, never be missing. I know I have failed in many places, and I'm praying that the Lord may give me the grace so that I may represent him fully. But this point number seven of care and compassion, even on those who are on the wrong side, should be not even principle number seven, but principle number one on our list. Many a times we miss this care and compassion for those who are erring and uh, we would like to see arrows flying and meeting the hearts of those who does, do, don't agree with us. And uh, another thing is that uh, another eighth principle, the, the eighth principle is that uh, may we focus on the, uh, may, may, may we try to understand the motive behind what everyone is doing. Now, I know somebody may say, Will you look into the motive of a person who has gone to kill somebody? I'm not talking about these extreme cases. Um, there was a case where actually uh, a brother was rebuking a sister because uh, she had uh, a short skirt. Not knowing that uh, this, this girl was coming into truth and even she didn't have money to buy something to feed herself. And you will say, Maybe she could have borrowed a lesso and uh, covered herself very well. But uh, you, you don't know the motives of the people and the reason why they are doing what they are doing. Try to understand what people are doing and why they are doing what they are doing. That may be the only long cloth that somebody is having, yet you are rebuking him that uh, they have a short cloth. You don't know the reason why people are doing things. We as ministers, we are ready to rebuke than to care about the flock. Feed the sheep, feed the lambs, and then feed the sheep. Meaning that there are sheep in the congregation, they should be fed. These are people who are mature. But we have also lambs in the church, which should be fed. And then when they grow up, again, we are told, feed the sheep. It doesn't mean that when the sheep have, when you when you feed the lamb and it becomes a sheep, that is the end of feeding that uh, sheep. We are told feed the sheep. Those who already are mature, then start feeding these lambs. When they grow, they become sheep. But also, you are again told feed. That statement is so important when uh, Jesus is speaking to Peter, and so we don't know why people are doing some things. It is not our duty to be so rash in rebuking them why they have done such and such a thing. We should be a people who are actually are 
are able to be guided by principles and never read into the motives of people. And so all kinds of reformations should be uh, conducted in a way that uh, it will not be condemnatory but reformatory. For Jesus came to heal the sick. He did not come to heal those who are already healthy. Let us never give an excuse to other people not to accept reformation. Because once you close those doors, opening them, it will not be a, a simple thing. And so those are things that we need to be careful about. And uh, I pray that uh, God may give us uh, that uh, spirit of uh, discernment to know when to speak and when not to speak about some things that are happening in our midst. Now, there is the issue of the true education, which I, I'll want to visit, because this is another sensitive issue when it comes to the reformatory messages uh, in a in a in a in a in our time and the way it is conducted. And uh, I, I just like to revisit this issue. I talked about it, the age of going to school and which school. And uh, what are the guiding principles when uh, we are talking about these messages? Let us look at uh, some of these uh, principles she talked about when it comes to educational lines. And uh, the similarity between Ellen White's educational reform message and that of a few Clear voices of her time rest on the obvious fact that all those involved in educational reforms were contending with the same problems. One of the problems these people were contending with, which we are contending with too, we are appealing to common sense. How do we preach these end time messages? And it will be good to look at the problems they had and the problems we are having, how they dealt with them and how we can deal with them in these end times. Because, you know, there's no rush in anything god calls us into intelligent faith maybe somebody may say intelligent means that uh, everything every doubt may be removed that is not what i'm saying we are told that um, when deciding something you should know why you are deciding something and that is first peter chapter 3 verse 15 that um, um you may give a reason you don't give a reason for something that you don't know so we must have a, a an answer that makes sense uh, for what we are doing and uh, it should be something convincing god calls us into faith but faith comes by hearing the word and by hearing the word that is getting information so that you may be able to defend your faith faith comes by hearing the and by hearing the word of god and so we must be intelligent to the what the word of god says so that we may answer for our faith and so there are things which we are uh, really struggling with that also they struggle with, also on this educational line center, it will be good to see what they faced and what we have to face, how they dealt with them and how we have to deal with them. And so some of the problems that they dealt with is classic curricula rather than a more practical education. Poorly ventilated, poorly lighted classroom, direct relationship between manual training, exercise with mental vigor, even spiritual values, and education as an important factor in character development. Especially when Bible-oriented reformers attempted educational reform, one would expect general agreement on principles and practice. Ellen White understood this when in her book, Education, she wrote this remarkable summation of educational principles. We can trace the line of the world's teachers as far back as human records extend, but the light was before them. As the moon and the stars of our solar system shine by the reflected light of the sun, so as far as their teaching is true, do the world's great thinkers reflect the rays of the sun of righteousness. Every gleam of thought, every flash of the intellect is from the light of the world. What is E.G. White trying to say? There are some things that are even taught in secular schools. There are things which are taught by people who have never professed Christianity, yet they are true in their sense because no human being manufactured the knowledge they have. They are a gleam from the sun of righteousness. 
take an example, this controversy that uh, when implementing true education, you can't even go into a secular mechanic shop to learn that because you may be affected by um, being in contact with somebody who is not uh, a Christian. Or even say that um, you can go into a workshop of a carpenter who is a Catholic to train carpentry because you may be coming in contact with the purpose. This is an appeal to common sense. These are some of the useless things we hear sometimes that lack wisdom. The gleam of the light they have on carpentry, electricity, farming, mechanics, it is a gleam from the sun of righteousness. And if we can get the information without being contaminated, now, get me clearly, I'm not sending people to schools where they'll be contaminated. We are told in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. And she co comments on that, that uh, come out of every institution which will plant in the hearts of the youth, that which is found in the book of Timothy, having a form of goldness, but denying the power therein. This is not what I'm promoting. But to say, I won't go to learn carpentry in somebody who is not a Seventh-day Adventist workshop because they don't believe like me. You are, you, are, you are not going to be preached to. Come on. We are going to learn something. And so an appeal to common sense. There, there are things, these are the, the things they faced. Can somebody go to do mechanic in a mechanic shop, which is not of a Seventh-day Adventist? Can he go to learn carpentry? Can he go to learn electricity? And it is not like you are going to have there a religious service before you start the daily training. It is just you go there, you are you are trained how to put woods together, you are trained how to put uh, timbers together, you are trained how this wire does this and this wire does this. You are trained even uh, garment cutting in tailoring shop in symmetry, symmetry, and. Uh, to deal with this issue as if now we are not still in the world but in heaven, it's something that uh, really concerns us. And so you find that many youths who call themselves true reform, uh, present truth speakers, they'll tell you, oh no, you, you cannot, that is yoking yourself with unbelievers. No, brothers and sisters, this is an appeal to common sense. It is not yoking yourself with unbelievers. And uh, may the Lord help, because these are the things that people used to face and all that. Is there anything unique about Ellen White's principles of education? Her special contribution lies in the unity and clarity of her educational philosophy. And um, encumbered with the fads and false leads of 19th century contemporaries, although a few contemporaries also also saw the religious purpose of education. Miss White placed education within the great controversy theme, including its vital role in eschatology, the study of last day events. Originality is not the taste of a prophet. Dynamic freshness, coherence, and unity that harmonize with the Bible are learning. Look at what we are told. Learning an occupational skill was urged not merely to be prepared to earn a living if circumstances required such but also to add vigor to mental studies and to provide a special opportunity for character growth. Learning a trade will help produce a more elevated class of youth with stability of character. They will have perseverance, fortitude, and courage to surmount obstacles. In fact, if students had to make a choice between a knowledge of the science, Sundays or a knowledge of labor for practical life, Ms. White would, be, would unhesitatingly answer the latter, that is the practical life. If one must be neglected, let it be the study of books. School curriculum must be organized to fulfill educational highest aim. The contrast between secular and Bible centered curricula is seen most clearly in how the nature of human beings is perceived. Are we products of an evolutionary ascent or are we created beings made in the image of our creator? Is education a matter of getting ahead and succeeding in secular career, or is it a process of allowing our creator to work out his original plan for human? And talking about um, uh, having a curricula, yes, sometimes we talk about um, God will give you guidance and wisdom on how to upbring your child into education. But then 
that does not do away with common sense, at least you must have a program to guide you and to follow. You, you just don't wake up one day every morning and God says, you know, today you are going to teach your child science between 7 a.m. to uh, 9 a.m. And then at 10, you will do this and this. This is not. You must have a program, a curriculum for following along. And then God will give you wisdom as you teach these things, more information and knowledge, how to guide these children along. You know, this is why we have had uh, uh, rubbing shoulders with the government because the government comes, you say, I'm practicing true education. They ask you, what is true education? The harmonious development of the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. And then they said, well and good. I, I saw some interview the other time of uh, the people of Tanzania who were actually implementing true education in it was, uh, it was uh, something to watch. And uh, they say, now, can you explain this thing? When you talk spiritual, what is it? And you start explaining. When you talk about physical, um, you explain and uh, um, spiritual, physical, and then mental. And you, you can be able to articulate these things in theory well. And then they tell you, okay, we have heard you. Can you show us the practical aspect of these things? How you are doing them? And uh, you hear people that uh, I'm just teaching the child the Bible alone to prepare him for heaven. And the police were like, no. You yourself, you have a skill. Do you have? Yes. What can you do? This and this. Why is it that you don't want a child to know something to do? Are you training this child to be a thief? Or what? are you in some kind of cult? Or what are you doing? What do you mean that just you are making the child know the bible and uh, how can can you demonstrate mentally how this religious uh, is affecting the practical and the mental and uh, you know when they test our children they find that they are dwarfed and uh, they don't have idea of any practical kind of living and all their conclusion is that you are training children to be ignorant of everything. You are indoctrinating your children. You know, Seventh-day Adventists should be the most educated people in the land. And I mean it by saying that. There is nothing that should come to our attention which you cannot really identify with spiritually, mentally, and practically. We should be ahead of our health system we should be ahead of our financial system. We should be ahead of uh, our agricultural and food industry system. We need to be more practical until if you have to meet a police officer and you have to explain what is true education, it should never start even on a theory. You should be able to take the police officer in your garden and say, this is true education that I'm showing you. And the police officer should leave your home with sugar cane. He should live with the vegetable. He should live with something to go and eat as an example of true education. And uh, he has to see your mental keenness in what you are doing. Not that you are just um, reflecting other people's uh, ideas, but actually you have something stable that you can explain yourself in an understandable level and uh, a way that uh, they can be able to understand. And uh, when uh, they visit your home, they have to see actually the true education, spiritual, how it's applying, not to meet somebody who is arrogant and uh, can't even have manners while speaking to them. How to make these things practical has been the problem in that that is why we rub shoulders with the people who are uh, are prejudiced against our message of uh, true education, what in it uh, encompasses. And so this is something that has to be looked into that um, we need to not leave the theory. Christ says that you should have done this without neglecting the other. If we have to explain this thing theoretically, the practical aspect has to be there. And to neglect one uh, at the expense of the other and then say that we are practicing true education, it will be bad. 
say that uh, you are talking about the mark of the beast and the collapse of uh, the financial system and all this stuff. And then the policeman say, I'd like to sit down with you. You explain this thing well about the mark of the beast, the financial fail, uh, 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 collapse and all these things. And uh, you give him, he gives you an audience and you sit down with him and say, you know, in this, all these cases, we have what we call the little time of trouble and the great time of trouble. And you start explaining about these two troubles and um, you reach at a point and you tell the policeman, you know, in this little time of trouble, God will not take care of us. He will take care of us during the great time of trouble. And he asks you, then how will we fare in the little time of trouble? And you, uh, you, you tell him, you know what? We shall survive with the skills or what we have on our lands. And then he asks you, what skill do you have? Or what skills have you taught your children? You don't have a skill. Your children don't have a skill. He looks at your garden, it's bushy. It has been neglected because you are going door to door preaching. You give an excuse, such an excuse. And he looks at your message. Yes, theoretically, the message is true. But he looks at the practical aspect of it and he sees a people whose faith will fail during the little. This policeman who is not a Christian sees a person whose faith will not stand during the little time of trouble. And then he looks at your education and he says, you see what, young parent, by tomorrow morning I need your children in school without failure or you face imprisonment. And here you are, a theory without a practical aspect of message. And that is why Christ says we must live Christ-like. And Christ himself learned a trade. He was a carpenter. He had something to do. We cannot say that we have been called full-time into the gospel and then neglect to be practical in our lives. Paul, the greatest evangelist to ever attend to the message of his time, had a trade to do. And so for the children to grow in ignorance of uh, being intelligent, I'm not just talking about learning something. If they have to learn computer, let them learn thoroughly in that they can even repair the computer. It's not just about reading, typing, on your keyboard and sending a page into the printer to print. Can you manage the printer? Can you manage the computer? I'm not talking about you being in quotes a wizard of those things, but having a knowledge that if these things break down, I can do ABC before even I call a qualified technician to do that. We we know that there are some dangerous things that you cannot you you cannot do without a a, a qualified technician. Talk about um um. Uh, uh, interacting with electricity, that's not just something to attend to if you are not qualified because it is fatal. You can die anytime. And every work is fatal if you don't know it. You, you can be a farmer and uh, you don't know how to mix this and you mix that and then it ends up killing you uh, in agricultural lines. More so, people who still practice agriculture and they, they are still into this uh, poisonous substance, it's not organic food. And even in organic farming, you need to know what should be done in the farm and all that. We should be intelligent, not theoretical in what we are doing. I hope we understand each other on the how do we teach these end time messages. And so we need to be so practical with our messages. And so you don't just wake up and you, you don't have a program. You, you, you are just doing things in a half as at work. Um, Making the Bible the basis of our education does not mean that it is to be the only textbook for classes such as arithmetic languages and geography. I know people will defend this a lot, but uh, this is um, in uh, Messengers of Life, page 347, paragraph 3. I'll repeat. Making the Bible the basis of our education does not mean that it is to be the only textbook for classes such as arithmetic languages and geography. The Bible was not given to the human family to be it is based encyclopedia, but it does give a worldview that helps to interpret and apply information. Ellen White noted that all academic disciplines, every area of thought, take a new significance when seen in the light of great controversy theme. She meant that all classes must be taught within the framework of the biblical worldview, that every class should reflect the grand purpose of 
Christian education to restore in man the image of God. And uh, when we talk about uh, everything not being in the Bible, uh, I, I like to be understood well. Talk about languages. There is no French in the Bible. There is no French classes in the Bible. But we need French because people need to go to be missionaries in France. We need different languages to learn. And so not all everything will come from the Bible. But then when it is taught within the framework of the great controversy, why are you learning what you are learning? Then you can even go to the secular teachers to learn something which is profitable within the framework of the great controversy. I hope we understand each other. I can tell somebody, you know, I'm a Westerner and uh, I need somebody from Nyanza to come and teach me their language so that if I have to go to that place and I don't have an interpreter, I can articulate their language in a way they will understand. And so I can talk to a teacher from th that region or from Rift Valley or from whichever place. I, I, tell, I, I tell him or I tell her, I need my children to learn this language. I need my children to learn English. I need my children to learn Swahili. I need my children to learn Luo, Kikuyu, or whichever language that uh, you will want the teacher to teach. This is not in the Bible, but the framework is within the great controversy so that if they find themselves in some place doing missionary work, it may be easier for them. So I hope that it's understood that everything is not in the Bible and you can call upon a secular teacher to be able to teach your children such a things within the framework of the great controversy that they are being trained for missionary work and they are not just being trained so that they may go everywhere bragging, I know seven languages, I know 10 languages, I know 11 languages. This is not the reason for such a skills being attained. The skills are attained within the framework of the great controversy. How do they fit in the picture of spreading the third angel's messages? You know, uh, the reason I say this strongly is because there are people who are opposed to anything uh, that seems that it is secular in a way. Uh, the influence we lay before the people we meet should be an influence that does not uh, leave fanatism uh, along the trail. People say, you, you look at those fanatics that uh, they don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do that, and they don't do that. We should not be a people where people, we should not be a people who people point at and the only thing they can say, those people don't do that, those people don't do that, and those people don't do this. We should be a people that when people point at us, they can be able to expound the important things we do for the community, not just for the life here on earth, but even for the life after. And this will foster the rapid growth of the third angels or the rapid uh, spread of the third angels uh, message. Uh, so uh, in uh, Messenger of Light 347 to 348, still speaking on this issue, and uh, I'll share it on the screen, we are told this. Higher education more than information. When Ellen White spoke of higher education, she meant more than schooling beyond the 12th grade. In fact, higher education had more to do with a religious experience than with advanced information. Higher education calls for something greater, something more divine than the knowledge to be obtained merely from books. It means personal experimental knowledge of Christ. It means emancipation from ideas, from habits and practices that have been gained in the school of um, the prince of darkness and that that is the scope of uh, higher education it's not just letting our children have information but um, having principles inculcated in them that um, are higher than uh, a human thought can give and uh, uh, the issue i'm still on the educational line, the issue of our children growing up as social misfits. And uh, we have heard statements that E.G. White had never allowed her children uh, uh, out of her sight or in the families which she were not sure of 
And um, we take this statement to mean that the children of E.G. White were confined social misfits. This is the assumption that comes to our minds. And we think that these children never had recreation. These children never had to mingle with the people. Recreation, she says, is needful for those who are engaged in physical labor and is still more essential for those who labor in principle, principally mental. It is not essential to our salvation or for the glory of God to keep the mind laboring constantly and excessively even upon religious themes. She insisted on the issue of recreation where, far, where, where children are not just confined, but they are given freedom not to go and indulge in, with sinful children, but um, uh, withdrawing them from the busy programs and uh, uh, allowing them with together with them to have some recreation and uh, several families to unite and uh, make an excursion into the country with the tasty and wholesome food uh, in their baskets and the children to enjoy time. And that is uh, where she says that... Uh, uh, even those who are going to the country, they should go two by two so that um, children may not become social misfits. Parents should become children with their children, making everything as pleasant for them as possible. Let the whole day be given to a recreation, so, so she says. And uh, um, she, she talks about um, being so hardliners on the children. She says that never hurry your children into adulthood. And that is so more important in educational lines in that um, younger children are um, made to bear the burdens of adults. She says that never hurry your children into a, 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 a adults. Let the children be children. And for their sake, you as a parent become a child. Come to their level. And let them enjoy their childhood because it's just a period they will they, they, they will pass and then they'll become adults. And so there are parents who are so harsh with their children, they are confined, they have become social misfits. They don't these children loom, live in a very gloomy way. And uh, you know, uh, I'd just like to put something on the board also. Um I think it is in Ephesians. Um, Ephesians chapter 6. Let us look at the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. There are some important things that um, we are told in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, sorry. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at this. Um, we are told, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. But look at verse 4 now. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in a nurture, up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Of the Lord. So, Provoke not your children, we are told. This is in Ephesians. And I think there is a, another verse somewhere that um, I can't remember so well. But we are told we should never provoke um, our children lest they give up. Uh, I look for this one. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 21. So, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is taking care of them tenderly. Don't hurry them into things. Don't be always pointing fingers at them. And then uh, in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, we are told, Fathers, 
provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. And so there is the aspect of nurturing them. Nurture, nurture. And this word is so important. And admonition, instruct. Be wise in what you are doing. And then there is the aspect of uh, if you do these things in a way that are not tried, the children get discouraged. And so we should be careful on how we raise up our children so that um, they, they may not be rushed, rushed into adulthood. They, not, they may not be social misfits also. And so when uh, she was penning down the book of education, she devoted a chapter to recreation. In that chapter, she differentiated between recreation and amusement. Recreation, when true in it, to in its name, tends to strengthen and build up. Fostering togetherness and a relationship, a bond between the parents and the children which cannot be broken. And so calling us aside from ordinary cares and a occupation, it affords refreshment for mind and body and thus enables us to return with new vigor to the earnestness of the work. But uh, what is the problem that we are facing? We think that the best way to raise up our children is just to pile this and this before them. And uh, as it is in the secular world, you know, the problem with secular education, it has been competition. L let us not even think about other things. There are many things in secular education which are wrong. Uh, the mixing of truth and error. But the main problem has been uh, uh, competition per se, where actually others are made to feel that they are not good enough to be part of the society. Because uh, as uh, one brother was saying, you look at somebody who has an A and he looks down at somebody who had an E in exam. But then God did not create men same. This person who is good and has an A in a certain thing, when you bring a certain thing to this somebody who had an E, he will be better than this person who has an E. And an example was being given of uh, an elephant, a bird, and a fish being told to swim, and all of them had to be number one. It's a funny illustration, but it's not funny at all. And so this is what we do in secular education. We take a fish, an elephant, and we take a bird, and we put them in the water, and we say that all the three of you should be number one. That is how secular education, how worse the secular education is. And uh, the, 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 the difference between this education, secular education and true education, is that in true education, which is a Christian education, actually everyone is given chance according to how God created them. Like, I'm not an evangelist. If you told me to be an evangelist, it will be a hard thing. There's another person who is an evangelist. If you told you told them, now you person be just an author and sit down on your computer, research and do this thing, they'll tell you, my brother, you are giving me something which is so hard to do. There is a preacher and he cannot be a teacher. And you will say, what is the difference between these things? You try out them, that is when you will know the differences. But I'm telling you, some were apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, some pastors. It doesn't say all were prophets. It doesn't say all were teachers. It means there is a difference. And so having an education where you think that people can be the same thing when they have been endowed differently, it is something that we are being told that we should avoid. Even the way that uh, sometimes we teach um the issue of medical mission or that uh, you know you have to know every hub and this and so it is thrown at people that you should know every hub no god has not given everyone mental capacity to know every hub there are people who are endowed with that we have medical missionaries with different degrees of understanding things and uh, absorbing things and so we should not take you know, we have been called from the world, but it seems that we carry the baggage of the world into religion. We think that uh, now it is a modification of this. Religion is not a modification of secularism. It's not a modification of unbelief. 
it is a transformation into the image of Christ and Christ never created people the same way. He endowed people with different. In fact, when talking about Christ creating people in different ways, uh, there is a verse that comes to my mind. It is in the book of Ephesians. I think uh, I can find it so quickly. Uh, Ephesians, uh, is it chapter 4? And then look at this. But to unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Not everyone is endowed with the same measure of everything. Christ gives everyone according to the measure they can receive. And uh, when you go to the book of um, Romans, Romans, uh, from uh, Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 3, look at this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man, not to all men, every man, the measure of the faith. So to every man is given a measure of faith. Verse 4 says, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts. Differing according, differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And conspicuously, verse 12 says, let love without be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Verse 10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. And so everyone is given a measure of what they should be. And so to carry what is taught in secular schools, to carry that baggage into Christianity that we have to be the same thing, actually it is just conducting secular education while it is baptized with the name true education. And uh, this is an appeal to common sense. How shall we preach this message of uh, the end time? What are the guiding principles that we have to look at? And uh, men and women are to reach the highest possible degree of excellence that God has set before them. But this cannot be reached in a way that uh, secular education is conducted. This cannot be reached in a uh, selfish spirit. And a very important thing, this cannot be reached on human standards, that anyone can be a criterion to the other. Higher than what human mind can ever think is God's ideal for his children. And so uh, we should understand that uh, we are dealing with minds. And not only dealing with minds, but we are dealing with the children of God. That is why he says, come out of her, my people. When they are still in Babylon. He says that uh, come out of her, my people. And uh, these minds should be dealt with judicially and uh, with uh, the wisdom that uh, God has uh, uh, given unto us and uh, being careful that uh, we should not be an offender of uh, the world. And so, as I try to wrap this up, uh, I'd like to just uh, try and read something. Uh, and uh, you will bear with me for a moment uh, that I um, wanted to find a statement. 
we are not the same. We are not uh, the same. And so the way we deal with each other should be, we should be so cautious and not bring a reproach in uh, in the fathering of this message. If uh, we can uh, be able to be educated in the school of Christ, we shall be able uh, to accomplish much. We shall be able to accomplish much. If I don't get the statement, then I'll talk about uh, something else. But then... Uh, God has made us different and uh, we should appreciate each other as God uh, as God has uh, made us. Yeah, th this is something that uh, uh, I wanted to read in image 483.1. There's a statement that she says. There are not two whose experience is alike in every particular. The trials of one are not the trials of another. The duties that one finds light are to another most difficult and perplexing. And that is a very interesting statement to Think about that um, we are not constituted alike. Our experiences are not uh, the same. So we we should be carefully when uh, we are we are dealing with the. Uh, different minds and the last thing i wanted to read is this two things and then we close uh this is in uh in uh minister of healing page 495 paragraph three minister of healing again we are told all who profess to be the children of god should bear in mind that as missionaries, they will be brought into contact with all classes of minds. There are the refined and the coarse, the humble and the proud, the religious and the skeptical, the educated and the ignorant, the rich and the poor. These varied minds cannot be treated alike, yet all need kindness and sympathy. Remember our principle number seven, we should be caring and compassion so these varied minds cannot be treated alike yet all need kindness and sympathy by mutual conduct our minds should receive polish and refinement we are depended upon one another closely bound together by the ties of human brotherhood heaven forming each on other to depend a master or a servant or a friend bids each on other for assistance call till one man's weakness grows the strength of all. I like this last statement that she makes, that um, heaven forming each on other to depend. So I depend on my wife. My wife depends on me. I depend on my brother in Christ or the brother in Christ depend on me. A master or a servant or a friend, I may depend on my master, I may depend on my servant, I may depend on a friend, and they in turn may depend on me. Bids each on other for assistance call. We cannot say we have reached and uh, I'm the master, I'll never be the servant, and I know everything and no one can, cons I can consult no one. No, bids each on other for assistance call till one man's weakness grows the strength of all. And so it is interesting from uh, the weakness of another person, we can grow the strength. So you who are thinking that you are stronger than the other, know that your strength will be drawn from a weak person, even among us. These are, these are the principles to guide us into the 
in the end time messages. If we don't get this thing right, we may have the theory of this issue, the third angel's message, but never reach any heart that uh, we are trying to bring into truth. And then the, the last statement is this. Uh, just try to bring on board the last statement. And uh, we'll go down and um, this is, we need more of Christ-like sympathy, not merely sympathy for those who appear to us to be faultless, but sympathy for poor, suffering, struggling souls who are often overtaken in fault, sinning and repenting, tempted and discouraged. We are to go to our fellow men touched like our merciful high priest with the feeling of uh, their uh, infirmity. And uh, this is uh, 1SM 118. 1SM 118, paragraph 2. In the work for this time, it is not money or talent or learning or eloquence that is needed so much as faith graced with humility. No opposi opposition can prevail against truth presented in faith and humility by workers who willingly bear toil and sacrifice and reproach for the master's sake. We must be co-workers with Christ if we will see our efforts crowned with success. We must weep as he wept for those who will not weep for themselves and plead as he pleaded for those who will not plead for themselves. And that uh, that is just laying a foundation. This is not everything that we can talk to. There are so many things we can talk about. But um, I feel that um, from that you can have a springboard to understanding more principles in uh, presenting our end time messages. And so I appeal to myself, I appeal to you that uh, we may seek divine guidance in how we should preach our messages. The world is in darkness, brothers and sisters, and it doesn't need people who don't have balanced mind and who doesn't know how to approach things lest we drive people away than we move them closer unto ourselves. And more so in uh, different lines of uh, reformative uh, or reformatory messages, we need to be careful because we are not only touching the hearts, the minds of the people, we are touching their physical aspect, that is their bellies, their outward appearance, and all that stuff. And one word misplaced, you will never find that soul that should be in the kingdom of God. And so may God help us and uh, may he work in us and uh, that we may be vessels that are of honor that can be used in the sanctuary of the Lord shall we pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, I just pray that uh, you may forgive us for our misplaced words that uh, have ever been. And uh, I pray that you start with me, Lord. Give me uh, a speech. Give me a mouth that will be divinely uh, propelled and not act from feelings and emotions. And uh, thank you for your children. Thank you for your ministers. Thank you for evangelists, preachers, pastors, prophets, and apostles among us. We pray that uh, each one of us may not just be high-minded and go beyond that which you intend them to go, but remain on that narrow door that uh, will lead others to righteousness. And so thank you for forgiveness, and thank you for giving us a chance to learn. In Jesus' name, amen.